Hallelujah. Lord, you are so good. And you are so good to me. And Lord, we glorify you and we praise you for your goodness, for your kind intention towards us, for your loving mercy. Lord, you are so, so good. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. There is none like you. You are faithful and you are true. And Lord, we honor you and we praise you. And we thank you. We thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. We magnify you. We set our focus and our attention on you and you alone. We cast aside every weight and every distraction. And Lord, we're going to honor you with our tithes and with our giving now. And Lord, then we're going to continue to worship you because you are worthy of our praise. You are worthy of our honor. And Lord, we love you, we love you, we love you, and we are grateful. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, everybody. I know it feels like a long time, but I didn't, y'all didn't get to miss me because I was here last Sunday. Uh, we've had a full week, but uh, you can be seated. We're going to... Um, we're going to receive the morning offering. Children, you are released to your classrooms. Thank you for that. And, um, you know, the more that I think about the goodness of God, the more excited I get about my giving. Because when you realize, um, you know, just like Minister Rose was saying this morning about that all of God's plans for us are good. All of them. So when we look at the goodness of God, we see that's his will for our life is for us to walk in that goodness. And um, we were at a minister's conference this week, and several of the ministers talked um, a lot about, um, you know, that God's, God's desire is for us to profit and prosper. And so if you, but we don't give to prosper and prosper, prosper and profit, we give because we have been blessed, right? We're not trying to get something from God, and it's it's the it's a shift in in what we how we see ourselves in Him. If we see ourselves as prosperous, then we give because we know that God has given us all things. If we are, if we give grudgingly or of necessity, oh well, it's that time of service. They're going to ask for money. That's, that's not it. It's that we provide an opportunity for you to sow. And we, you know, the scripture does say that the tithe comes to the local church. And, and it was funny because um, one, of the, one of the ministers this week was going through line upon line, precept upon precept, and kept going back to, and your tithe goes to your local church. And these are other ministries where they don't have a church, right? So they rely on, on people give above their tithe. And... Now, when we see when we see verse ten in Second Corinthians chapter nine, verse ten, and it says, "Now may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food supply and multiply the seed that you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness, while you are enriched in everything for all liberality, which causes thanksgiving through us to God." Now. I want, I want to look at that in the Amplified for a minute. 2 Corinthians 9, 10, and 11. Now, where does your seed come from? You know, it's a funny thing because uh, there's a scripture. I don't, I don't have the reference right now. But there's a scripture that basically says only a fool says that it's by your breath and your own effort that you have what you have. And we're not fools, Right. So though we may have worked hard for everything that we have, we understand that it was the breath of life from the Lord God Almighty who gave us the breath and to go and to work. And then on top of that, he gave us the favor to get a job because there was a day where jobs were actually competitive. If you don't have a job, but out and God who provides seed for the sower and bread for eating. So who's providing your seed to sow, 
who's providing the bread that you eat? Even if you're on keto, you're still eating something, right? Just recognize God provided your food for you, even if you think, no, I worked hard for this. Stop with that mentality. That mentality makes you your God. That makes you setting you on the throne of your heart instead of God on the throne of your heart. That's an idol. We don't participate in idol worship. We, we need to arrive at the place where we recognize it is only the goodness of God that has brought me to a place where I have seed to sow and bread for food. Now, listen, you should work hard, acknowledging that God is the one who causes you to prosper, right? Everything that you set your hand to prospers. Why? Because he's blessed it, right? He's blessed the work of your hand. Everything goes back to originating with the goodness of God, the love of God. He, the reason why he does what he does for us is because he loves us. Now, if you've struggled and you've had hardships, don't despair. You can come out the other side. You know, tell, we tell Victoria all the time, we're Owens. We overcome and we adapt. It's what we do. It's not that we don't have hardships. It's not that we're not faced or confronted with things that we don't love and enjoy. But we adapt and we overcome because that's who we are. In, in Christ, that's who we are is we're overcomers. We're more than conquerors. So if you're in a hard spot, don't despair. Lean on the goodness of God. L yield to the love of God who wants you to prosper. Right? If you prosper, that gives you more seed. To do what? To eat? Okay. We all know I like sunflowers, right? Okay. In one of these, how many, how many, how many seed did it take to get this? One. So one seed was planted. Now, inside of here, there's more what? And inside the center of the sunflower, there's seeds. Let's pretend there's 100 so that math becomes easy. Okay? So if we have 100 seed come out of this sunflower, that might be a lot. Let's say 10. There's 10 seed come out of this sunflower. How many are we supposed to plant? Pre present back to God. One. Is that terrible? That means you get to eat how many? Nine. nine. So you eat nine, but you've planted one. How many sunflowers pop up with one seed being planted? A lot. Okay. But let's go with ten. Ten's good. Ten's good. And in the... George is helping me. Because you all have calculators in your phones, so you might be helping me in a minute, too. So we've got the still one that regrows, Right? And then we've got 10 more that grow. So now we have 11. And out of the 11, we take out 10 seed from each one. So we have 110 seed now. How many does God want us to sow back to him? 11. So now you get to eat how many? 99. Does this seem fair? I mean, God calls it like his principle, right? So he doesn't feel gypped off that you're eating 99 seed and just giving him back 11 because that's his principle. He's saying, give me your first, give me your best, and then what do you do? After you've planted those, they're not lost. You didn't put them in the fire and burn them up. You planted them. So now we plant 11 seed. So we've got the 11 plus the 11. So we got 22 growing just for the purposes of math. Right? So we pluck those up and we get how many? 220 seed. How many do you plant? 22. Now you have 198 seed to eat. Your belly's getting full, isn't it? <laughs> but what would have happened if the very first sunflower that got picked, you ate those all 10 sunflower seeds? You would say, well, you know, God said that I was supposed to get something, but I, I just don't see it. No, you don't see it because you ate your seed. He doesn't give seed for you to eat. He gives you seed to sow, and he gives you bread for eating. Right? This is what the scripture says. 
So what sometimes what we do is we end up eating our seed and then going, well, I don't understand why God's not prospering for me because you're eating your seed. And God who provides seed for the sower and bread for eating will also provide and multiply your resources for sowing. Your resources for sowing. But here's the thing. It's a heart principle. This is not about whether or not you do this mechanically. Where is your heart? Is your heart in your giving? If your heart is in your giving, then you're qualifying for this. He gives seed to the sower. You determine in your heart if you're a sower by your attitude, not by the, not by the action. And a lot of people sowed seed out of action instead of out of heart motivation. <clears throat> and he will also provide and multiply your resources for sowing and increase the fruits of your righteousness. The fruits of your righteousness, which manifests itself in active goodness, kindness, and charity. You will be more like your Father in heaven when you have a heart to give. When you have the heart of a sower, you become, your, your actual character, the fruits of your righteousness, become more like him. Now, we all say we want to be more like him, so let's not be stingy. Well, you're just trying to get my money. Keep your money. You're not going to get a harvest if that's the attitude that you sow with. And you're not going to get a harvest if you get super excited, throw money in the bucket, and then it passes, and you're like, oh, my Lord, what did I just do? No, you actually have to have a, cultivate a heart to give because that's who you are, right? And it doesn't matter how much you give to cultivate that heart on the inside of you. Listen, you know, Pastor Kurt's taken a button off his shirt and stuck it in the offering before just because he wanted something to give, Right? And we're going to pray over your offering regardless, but understand that it's where you are right now. And sow what you have, the ability to sow. And then when, as your heart starts transforming, you're going to start tithing because you have a heart to give. Not because you have to, because you don't have to. You, okay, the good God that we serve, he's not the mafia. Okay, he's not going to come and destroy your appliances and hit your car with a baseball bat if you don't give. Some people have taught tithing wrong. Some people have taught tithing that if you don't do this, you're going to end up cursed. God doesn't curse those he's already blessed. Now, you're going to find out that sometimes things go sideways and you're like, oh, I got to repent because I didn't do this right. And you should repent just because you did it wrong, but it doesn't mean God's the reason why you're experiencing what you're experiencing. But remember, you cannot serve God and man. You're either going to serve God or you're going to serve money, but you're not going to serve both. Money is just a tool. You know, mm, scripture. Verse 11, please. I'm button out. Thus, you will be enriched in all things and in every way so that you can be generous. And your generosity as it is administered by us will bring forth thanksgiving to God. Amen. You know, it was last Sunday, Minister Rose read a um, card that we got. We had sewn 40 Bibles into a women's recovery center or a recovery center, a recovery center. Um, and they sent, they sent a, a card to us to thank us. Well, that was, that was made possible by your giving. Right. So your giving caused that, that your giving to us caused Thanksgiving to God by other people who got blessed by your giving. Yeah. And that's a twice sown seed on your part. Yeah. So not only did you sow into the church, then the church sowed into somebody else. We provided the word of God and pe those people are going to be blessed. And that's going to your account. Yeah. See, we need to understand the seed does not stop here. The seed goes forth and it used to minister to God's people. Amen? Amen. So we already know that we do this with a cheerful heart, right? So go ahead and take your tithes and your offerings in your hand and say this with me. Father, in the name of Jesus, I present this to you with a heart of worship. Lord, help me to be honest with myself and that if I need to cultivate more of a giving heart 
You help me to do that. Lord, I thank you for giving me seed to sow. That you have given me food to eat. That you are the breath of my life. And you are the one who has prospered me. I acknowledge your love, your goodness, and your faithfulness in my life. And I bring this to you as an act of my worship. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Ushers, you can receive the tithes and offerings. You know, we, um, we didn't always receive the offering in, in between praise and worship. But, you know, the thing is that your giving is an act of your worship. So it, you're giving, when you give and you are giving in an act of worship, that's, this is the perfect place for it to be, right? That, that we, should, we shouldn't lose that attitude of worship in our giving. It should just be a continuation. Amen? Hallelujah. Men, if you are not registered for the men's conference, the men's advance, get registered. Um, we have Find Your Strength men's conference. It's men's advance. It is this Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. It's going to be awesome. You know, okay, let me, let me share this with you. So the Lord is trying to get something over to people about strength this year. So we were up at Andrew Womack's Minister's Conference this week, and the theme for it was um, be strengthened in the Lord. Okay? We didn't know that. I don't, I actually, I talked to some people who work for Andrew Womack Ministries, and they didn't know that. Uh, but it was on their banner when, when I parked in front of it. I, I said to Sharon Kay, I said, look at that. And she's like, oh. Right? We were, like, really shocked by it. We didn't know. It wasn't even on any other materials. But God's trying to get something over to us. So, listen, do what you got to do to be there. Amen? You will be blessed. It's, it's um, Thursday night. Thursday night. All, and then all day Friday and then Saturday. So, listen, you only have to take Friday off of work. Get here. If you do not have the finances or you just don't want to pay to come, it's only a $25 registration. Um, see James, he'll help you out with that. And we, because we, we want everybody to attend. Amen. Amen. And then we have a minister's conference. If you are called to ministry or think you are, um, come out November 3rd through the 6th. So it's going to start actually on our Wednesday night service. So come out for Wednesday night service, get yourself stirred up and be here for that. That's a free conference, but you still need to register. So we need to know who's coming. And um, there was something else I was going to say to y'all. Oh, nah, it's all good. All right. So I love you. And that minister's conference is going to take the place of minister's manna. So um, if you usually come to minister's manna, you can come to that too. All right. Hallelujah. Let's worship the Lord. Pastor Kurt has a lot to say, so we're going to be like, come on. Let's go. We ready? Yes. All right. We ready. We ready. We praise. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we praise you and we honor you. Father, we glorify you and we give thanks to you. Lord, we thank you for your goodness and for your wonderful works. Lord, you are greater than anything we have ever faced, greater than anything we're facing now and greater thing than anything we will ever face. Lord, you are our God. And Lord, we will see the goodness of God in the land of the living. Lord, that you will demonstrate yourself. And Lord, we will believe for greater and greater things. And Lord, we thank you for that, both individually and as a church. Lord, we thank you that we'll walk in your wisdom, we'll walk in your truth, we'll walk in your leading. And Lord, though we will encounter challenges, we will also see great victories. And Father, we thank you that you would utilize us individually and as a church to demonstrate there is only one Lord, only one God, only one King. Lord, we give you all the honor for it. Lord, today as we minister, Lord, I thank you that we'll, when we speak, we'll speak as the oracles of God. And when we minister, we'll do it with the ability that you supply that in all things, Father, you will be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning. Good morning. From me. You've already heard good morning from her. Yes. Exactly how sleepy are you that you are got brought a coffee cup up front? 
with my, two cups of coffee in with it. With two cups of coffee in it. We, uh, we had a long week. It was a good week. She told you a little bit about it, but it was a long week. And uh, altitude, that was fun. And um, we. Uh, but Victoria did great on the airplane trip. Yeah, she did do She awesome. had a big trip. Yes. Well, she saw deer for the first time. It's kind of. Oh, deer. Six deer. And then they saw Victoria. 15 turkey. Oh, and it was so cute because they'd never seen a human that small, it looked like. They just looked so intrigued by her. They could care less about the adults. But, but her, they were like, oh. And they're like this far from her. Yeah. And trying to figure out wh what she is. I would have let her pet them. But they were wild, dear. But uh, what, what was, uh, one of the things that was funny was is people saying, we came to see the baby. And, okay, uh, no, 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 no. You have to understand, there was lots of babies around. And, yeah, and they were it was saying she creepy. was the, the yeah. baby. And the baby. one lady walked up and looks at Victoria and says, yes, I had to see the baby. I, she didn't know either of us. I mean, we, I think she talked to her on the phone, but she said, I knew this had to be the baby by the description with a bunch of other babies up there. And it's like, yeah, That's she's the baby. The baby. <clears throat> She you know, is awesome. One of the things, um, and this is not a prideful statement. It's just, honestly, I hope it's an encouraging statement, both for you and your personal life and for your kids. You know, a lot of times people, one of the, the biggest things I think people have said about Victoria <laughs> is how sweet she is, how calm she is, how peaceful she is. And they mistakenly think that it's her. It is not her. Uh, you know, a lot of times children are products of what we make them. Right? And since before uh, Victoria was born, we decided what sort of child she would be and what her life would be like that she was not a fussy baby. She was a peaceful baby. She was a baby that had joy within herself. She was a baby that was happy by herself. Because I don't want her getting older chasing after some boy <laughs> because she's not happy with herself thinking the boy's going to make her happy. I don't want that. Not going to happen. And, um, and so those things, not only that, we demonstrate peace before her, right? We speak over her continually every time we change the diaper. Uh, you're a blessed baby. You'll never be a moment of heartbreak for the Lord Jesus nor for your mother or I all the days of your life. You live in peace. You live in joy, right? You will know Jesus from an early age. Know his voice and you'll follow it. You will be independent, but you will also be teachable. You will be submissive. At the same time, you will lead. That's, it's you not an accident. You're always at the right place at the You're right time, doing at, the right thing with the right people, getting the right results and glorifying God. Amen. And so those things, you know, you can begin to pilot your own life like that, like James chapter, what, two or three says. You can begin to, this is in the Old Testament, this is exactly what they did with their kids. It's the reason that names had meaning. It's the reason that you see, see Isaac today, we think it's just cute, Right? Well, Victoria, you know, that means victorious. Or, you know, Leon, that means lion. Isn't that cute? We just wanted something. No, those things were supposed to, when you, this is the reason Jesus chained Abraham's name. I'm going to call you this because that's what you're going to be. <coughs> and there was an expectation. That's where you'll end up. Yes. Amen. And so, you know, and, and that's not about us. Uh, honestly, it's about the fact that we implemented the Word of God. You know, if Victoria had ended up with a different family, she would have been a completely different person already than what you see. Mm -hmm. It's true. Are, are you with me? You know, and this goes to you too. Just because you were raised by some nick and poops doesn't mean you can't be a completely different person. Amen. Amen. I don't have to be that person. It'll just take a little longer for you to, out, to grow out of something because she's been navigated since she was... Before born. she was born. Yeah. yeah. You understand what I'm talking about? But we adapt and overcome. Amen. I wasn't, you know, there were certain things spoken <coughs> over me. I didn't have to end up like that. I could make a choice at any time. Amen. Amen. Yeah. I, I want to get into something. Uh, Pastor Terry, we um, were talking about this. There were some things I did not cover 
And I felt really rushed last service, to be honest with you. And I always feel like I get rushed right there at the end. Not of a service, but in this particular teaching. So I want to go over some things. And I want to point some things out to you, if we could. Is that all right? Okay. Again, we're talking about hearing from God. Romans chapter 8, verse 14. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to try to go over everything else that we've talked about, um, per se, I guess. Uh, do, you do have to realize the Spirit of God is on the inside of you. Amen. And so when you're looking for leadings, look to the inside. We need, we need to clarify that. <clears throat> the Spirit of God is on the inside of every born-again believer. That's true, yeah. Because, because we have too many people in the world going, oh, we're all children of God. Well, we all ought to be children of God. Well, th this, and this actually came up the other day. I was talking to a guy. He's a born-again, spirit-filled believer, head of a large company. And he said, you know, men are basically good. I said, no, they're not. Men are basically evil. I expect evil from men. The Scripture says that without Jesus, you are the life and the nature of the devil. We are not all... People say we are all God's children. No, we ain't. No, we are not. And Jesus was not... He didn't pull any punches about this. You, you're of your father, the devil. He didn't say we're all God's kids. Yeah. He said, no, I'm God's kid. Right. You're the devil's kid. Right. You are the life and the nature of wrath. This is the reason that people actually need Jesus. Right. And that's also the reason why this gospel is foolishness to those who don't believe. And so, so as we look at this, we need to understand that this is, if you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, this message is for you. Once you accept Jesus, this is the journey you embark upon, and it's an exciting journey, and you shouldn't get discouraged. You shouldn't get frustrated. You just need to lean into and yield to the grace of God on the inside of you to do this. And on the other side of it, you that are born-again believers, you ought to be demonstrating this. We shouldn't have to be wandering around wondering what to do. Right? If we have the source of all wisdom, all knowledge on the inside of you, we ought to make, be able to make pretty firm decisions on the, and make right decisions. Yes. Right? Are you there? Right. Okay, so for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. You want to make sure you got, got that Say in. something. Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> On TV, she used to say, let me read the scriptures because she said That's people are going to wonder why I'm standing here because I would just go off. Because I'm not mute. That's true. That's true. <laughs> for as many as are led by the Spirit of God. Now, notice here. As a mature child of God, you're supposed to be led by the Spirit of God. Now, we started to get into last week what that leading looks like. And um, let me, let's look over here at uh, Colossians right quick. Colossians 3 and uh, verse 15. And let the peace of God in your hearts, to which you also were called in one body... And be thankful. You missed the part. Yeah, let me take those off. All right. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which you were also called in one body, and be thankful. Now, this is, and if you actually look this up in the Amplified or the Greek, it talks about how this peace that's on the inside of you <clears throat> is going to be a peace that is to settle with finality questions that arise in your mind. And it is to give a ruling on those questions, like an umpire does, literally. Now, do you remember the days in sports before cameras? Right, because now, now, now they can take it for an instant replay to, to second guess whether or not the umpire or the referee made the right call. Really? Yeah. You could do a challenge. But, it, oh, okay. but anyway, it's okay. So, but, but before the cameras, that, once the umpire or the referee made the call... There was no questioning. That was it. You didn't, and, and, you know, we saw the team that the judgment was against not be happy, but it did not change the outcome. Once the referee said it, it was final. Once the, once the umpire said it, it settled it. And, and we need to understand that God is always right. Right. Now, one of the things about this piece is, is, is that you have to... This is more subtle than people would like it to be, right? Because it's something that you actually have to look for. Everything else about you personally, with the exception of your spirit, is self-diagnosing. 
Um, your body is self-diagnosing, right? You don't have to, when you get up in the morning, you don't have to start asking questions, how do I feel today, right? If you, you know, rolled your shoulder out, it tells you, hey, hey, just want you to know. I'm not in you, place anymore. I'm not in place anymore. Hey, just, it, just in case you was wondering, I'm hurting, right? You don't, have to, you don't have to ask that. A lot of times with your soul, your mind, your will, and your emotions, you don't have to ask your soul. You never had to say, hey, am I at my wit's end? Yeah, you're at your wit's end. Hey, are you on your last nerve? Yeah, I'm on my last nerve. No, it automatically spoke up and said, hey, just so you know, I'm at my wit's end and you're on my last nerve. Without a question, you didn't have to look for it. It didn't require subtly. Are, are you with me? Right. But when you want to know what the Spirit of God is ministering to you, where that leading, and you talk about your spirit man, you have to want to know this because it is not self-diagnosing. So, so think of it this way, since, since the analogy truly is baseball with the umpire um, and Pastor Kurt talked about balls and strikes last week. You know, there could be a player on the, t on the field, right? It's two outs and batters up and a runner is on, you know, first base. And then there's a pop fly. Y'all are following me so far? Okay. Um, <laughs> but go ahead. That's why I was Michael checking. will explain it to me after the okay. service. So, so then, so you're on first base. There's a pop fly, right? You start running the bases at, with two outs. At some point in time, the ball is caught from the air. And the umpire says out. If you're not looking at the umpire, you're still running bases. And you think you're doing great because nobody's challenging you. Right? And the other team starts running with you to home plate because they're going back to their dugout now. But see, that's, we have to be sensitive. We need to know, is this safe or is this out? Go ahead. Yeah, you have, to, you have to pay attention. You have to look because this is subtle, right? One thing about the Lord is, is, is you have to want Him. Your, your, your body is not a gentleman or a, uh, or a lady. It's not because it will interrupt anything to say something, right? Have you ever, ha you ever been in a meeting and it's gone way too long? Most meetings do. And uh, your stomach begin to say, hey, hey, just want everybody to know, I'm hungry. And it doesn't just notify you. People begin to turn and like, what was that? Uh, that was my body notifying me. And it, it's not willing to wait until other people quit speaking, not willing to wait. You know, even pain can hit you like that. Mm -hmm. Your mind can be like that. Can, all of a sudden, anger can try to come on you. Not wait for an appropriate time. Not wait till you're well rested so you can put it down. But you're, the, the Lord is a gentleman. Mm -hmm. He wants to be asked. There's a reason that the scripture says, I know what you need before you ask me, but I still would like to be asked. I'm not just going to butt in on your action. Are, are you with me? And so a lot of times this is what people are missing. Now, here's something else about this piece about, and it, let me just remind you of a couple things. We're not going to take time to turn there. We saw where a man knew to write two books of the Bible because it seemed right that he should do so. Did that was it, right? Uh, it, it, the, we saw where doctrine for the Gentiles which is all of us, I believe, right? All of us were affected by this and they came up with this doctrine based on what seemed right to them and to the Holy Spirit. And then ultimately, as we identify personally, a man's destiny, the difference between changing the world and fading away into obscurity was determined by that it seemed right that he should stay. 
The, and people, uh, variably, they say, well, yes, but you've got to remember, Pastor, I'm sure you don't know this verse, but the Bible actually says, there's a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end therein is destruction. I'm not talking about what seems right to your flesh. I'm talking about what seems right to the Holy Spirit that you are one with on the inside of you. Now, here's the thing. Most people in life encounter situations where something seems right or doesn't seem right to them, but they never can tell it till it's over. That's true. Right? Because they'll say something like this, something told me not to do this. Something told me to do that. Right? But they didn't, they didn't realize at the time it was so subtle it did not mark their attention. They kind of realized it happened, but it's like, oh, man, are, are you with me? And uh, there's a hesitancy. It doesn't seem right. You know, we just celebrated, uh, or not celebrated, acknowledged uh, 9-11. You know, there were a lot of people that day, if you listen to some of those testimonies, they said, I just didn't feel right about going into work that day. I just didn't feel right about it. What, how would it. What's another? It didn't seem right that I should go. Now, they thought of it as a feeling, but it's actually not a feeling. It is a perception. It is peace, see, uh, peace witnessing for or against something. I will have no peace about this, and I will have peace about that. Now, one of the big things that happens is, is because we are used to being carnal and we are used to uh, living in a self-diagnosing body is, is that people want that self-diagnosing. They want a leading that is carnal because that's what they're used to. Show me something. and Show me something. Make me feel something. That, you know, and a lot of times people say, well, I just got goosebumps over it. Great, but that's not my leading because that's still my flesh. I'm looking on the inside. Did the air conditioner ever just turn on suddenly and you got goosebumps? So can it get imitated? Yeah. And see, the thing of it, and that, that's a very, very good point. The devil can counterfeit anything that is associated with your senses. And that shouldn't be that big of a deal because Hollywood can counterfeit things that are associated with your senses. That's right. You know, and, and I've talked about this before. And, and folks, I'm telling you, if you want to survive in, in where we're going next, not just as a church but as a people, you got to get quit living by feelings. Because people who live by feelings get fooled. Right? And, and I, I love using movies as this example. But they, they make their money making you feel something, right? That you feel emotionally attached. You know, one of the biggest things that I, you know, one of the reasons that E.T. was such a big movie and for years was the biggest movie was because it took you on a joy ride. You laughed, you had fun, then all of a sudden everybody's crying, and then you're elevated at the end by the way you felt. I still remember sitting in the movie. I paid a lot of money back to me. What was a lot of money to go into that movie. And we're, I think he dies about, it's, it's years ago. This shouldn't be a spoiler alert, right? I mean, <laughs> but yeah, he, he dies like uh, about, I don't know, about an hour into the film. And I remember the girl that I was with. She's bawling her eyes out. And she looks over at me. I, I, I used to truly lack compassion. And she says, it's so sad. I said, he's not dead. And I said, we've only been in here an hour. If he dies and this is the end of this movie, I want my money back because this was a lot of money. That thing's got to come back. But she was crying like she lost a family member. And I'm thinking, you just met this thing less than an hour ago. It's not even human. Yeah, it's not even human. And see, that's the reason we're not big on going with feelings. People say, well, I feel this way. That is not the same as something seeming right. right. It's not the same. 
Peace is not a feeling. It is, it's an awareness. It's a, it's a state of tranquility. Yeah. It's undisturbedness. And see, listen, when, go ahead. What were you going to say? When something, um, when something disturbs you on the inside, I mean truly on the inside, you need to what, stop. If you have no peace about something, something doesn't seem right, stop. Whether it's about a person, it's about a trip, it's about anything. You are moving in a direction you are, or, and all of a sudden, you all of a sudden it seems on the inside of you that this does not seem right. I have no peace about this. Stop. Amen. And quit trying to figure out why you don't. Right. And, and, you know, that's a great point because too many times, you know, the Lord, the Lord has us to be unsettled about something, right? So that disturbedness shows up. Pastor Kurt always calls it like a check. Like you just know something's a little bit off. And then all of a sudden, we want to inspect and find out why. And the reason why we're doing that is because we were set on a course. And now we don't want to change the course. So we're looking for the reason why. Listen, if the Lord says stop, don't get preoccupied with why. Just stop and find out the new course. I, I think one of the clearest examples in my personal life was um, I was knife fighting in, uh, where was it? Down in South Florida. Remember the night with the truck on 95? So anyway, I was knife fighting down in South yes. Florida in Margate. I think it was in Margate and stuff because there's so many times. So, so anyway, I'd been down there. I was supposed to leave at like 9, did not end up leaving until 11 because I ended up doing a private session and then working with this guy. And so I'm on, I call her and said, hey, I'm actually not leaving on time, I'm, I know I'm running two hours late. Just wanted you to know where I was. So we were talking from Margate to, to Jupiter. Jupiter. And at Jupiter, I was either on 95 or you the must have been on, You must have been on I-95 because that's the way we always come. Yeah. And so, so I'm on 95 and I'm approaching Jupiter. And just as I drive past the exit, I actually told her out loud. I think I missed God. I think I just missed God. And she said, Because says, we wouldn't take the turnpike because where we live is just ever so slightly closer to take I 95 than the turnpike. And so I said, I think I just missed God. She says, what, what happened? I said, I'm pretty sure I should have gotten off and got on the turnpike because on the inside of me, that's the way it seemed I have to do. I had peace about going onto the turnpike. I actually had no peace about staying on 95. Now, I'm talking, and I, but I can tell something's going on. And I was thinking, well, what would be the big deal? I'm, I'm reasoning it out. I can't see anything. I, I don't see a reason. It wouldn't make logical sense for me to get off. But I something doesn't seem right. So I went, probably, we stayed on the, we were still on the phone. I, we, I drove another maybe five minutes, right? Now, this is long out of sight. I can't see anything. And then all of a sudden, traffic is completely stopped. And, I, and there's a helicopter flying around. And I can't figure out what's going on. So we are completely blocked on the road. And um, I said, well, I figured out why I shouldn't have taken this route. She said, what happened? I said, I'm in the middle of a, a major traffic jam. There's a, and I was able to see there's a fire and there's a, tra uh, there's a helicopter flying around and we are backed up for miles. And um, so... Uh, and you know those portions of road where there are no exits, right? Right. And so we're, I, I'm just stuck. And um, so I'm, and I think she you, Googled... You were, he was there long enough for the news to post what was going on. Yeah. And so uh, they, there was a FedEx truck that had caught on fire and that uh, they could not, the firemen could not put it out because they weren't sure what was on fire in the truck. And so they didn't know what chemicals to use because so their response was, we're just going to watch it burn, right? Well, the only thing that, one thing that happened was is the Lord said, listen, because I was in Elaine, go ahead and turn around and start heading back. Go, drive down the shoulder. 
And I'm like, I, I think I might get arrested for this, but I thought, you know, I said, you know, I'm not having a good night with you, so I'm just going to do what you say. <laughs> and so uh, you, you deal with the rest. So I turn around, come to find out, I drove maybe a mile, and what the, what the FHP was doing was they were turning all of the traffic around on the shoulders to push it back to uh, the, the exit so that we could drive off. They were doing all of that. And fortunately, I did listen to that, so instead of me waiting to, for them to come to me, I came to them and I got, I got was fine. But now I want you to notice here again, I, I, I was able to tell something was off. And I'm, I, I spent a lot of time working on this because this is, important. this is the most important thing in life is you being able to hear from God. It is the most important thing. After receiving Jesus. After receiving Jesus, yeah. Well, you, yeah, anyway. Um, I'm not without Jesus, so I don't, I don't think like a guy who doesn't have him. Right, and I'm not an evangelist. I mean, evangelists would stand up here and say, "I'd be willing to go to hell for you." You can go into hell for yourself. I, I, I'm not going. I, eternity's a long time, right? And so, I have anyway, I do the work of the evangelist. Uh -huh. in my job description. Yeah. So, so the thing of it is, is this is something really simple. Right. It is not life threatening. It was time threatening, but not life threatening. But God cared enough about it that he didn't want me sitting there in the traffic, all that. But I ignored him. Right. And, and, and just to be clear, we would have had no reason to Google what happened on I-95 the next day if he had taken the turnpike. Yeah. So, yeah. so we may or may not have known that that's what happened if he had followed God. Yeah, all we'd have known was you just need to get off the road. And too many, peop too many times we're trying to logic it out. Well, why, why, why do you want me to do this, Lord? Doesn't matter. Just do it. But, because here, here's the truth. You can't see far enough, far enough down the road. Amen. I couldn't see far yeah. enough down the road to make the right decision. Right. Literally, I could not see far enough down the road to make the life right decision. But I knew somebody that did, and he was willing to give me counsel. He was willing to give me direction. And I wanted to argue with somebody that could see further down the road. Mm -hmm. are, are you here? So when you're sitting there and you're like, well, I don't understand why God would have me get on the turnpike. You, are, you can't see down the road far enough. What in the world are you sitting there arguing for? Stop it. It does not have, it would have made no sense. It made no sense to my logical mind to switch roads. Because I was not, I was incapable of seeing far enough down the road. And you all have experienced this. Yes. And not, not only just with the Lord, but naturally speaking. Yes. You know, there, there's things that Victoria wants to put in her mouth, right? She does not understand why she's not allowed to put it in her mouth. But electronics do not go in the mouth. Power cords don't go in the mouth. But it all looks the same to her. She doesn't care. She wants to explore. But because we love her, we don't let her explore certain things. Right? And that's how the Lord is. He's like, listen, just do what I say. If you want to have a conversation later so that I'll explain it to you, you we don't mind teachable moments. The one thing about God, he never minds questions. He doesn't. And then some people are like, yeah, well, I want him to explain it to me. You need to accept the fact that it could be. You're too dumb right now to understand the answer. Well, and, and, okay, because, be, because. I'm sorry, was that? Harsh. Well, okay, here, here's the thing. Victoria is exceedingly intelligent. She is. But if I were to sit down with her and say, at 10 <laughs> months old, honey, you see where that power cord is connected? That's electricity in there. Now, electricity is a form of energy that will bite you pretty hard if you misabuse the laws that govern it. And so, I, when you put that in your mouth, you could become like a light bulb. You never will, obviously, because we're not having tragedies in the one household, but it is dangerous. And we don't want and it you to know accidentally what she would do? straighten your She'd hair. She'd look at me, at me and go, da-da, da-da. She is not going to say, I understand, Father. Yes, with the laws of thermodynamics, I can see where this would be critical in my understanding. 
that I should not take the power cord and shove it into my mouth. No, because though she is not stupid, she is ignorant and dumb at the level she's at to understand what daddy's saying. So you know what she ought to do? Put the thing down and say, Daddy said don't touch it. Amen. I'm not touching it. Yes. But why would that be? Don't know. I might lack the understanding to understand his answer. Yes. So all I have to do is do, be wise and obey. Yes. Do you realize that with Jesus defined one aspect of wisdom is this? You just do what I tell you. Who, why do you, remember what he said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, not do the things which I say? I'll show you a wise man, a wise man is here, he who hears my sayings and does them. He didn't even say he understood them. It says that he said, Jesus said to do this and I did it. And he is considered wise. Are you with me? That softened it up a bit, right? You guys feel better now? Okay, good. Yes, I, I know that I can be brutal, but uh, but it's effective. Listen, so, listen, I mean it's just true. Somebody's got to tell you, hey, dimwit, you're not smarter than God. And the quicker you realize that, the better off in life you're gonna be. Amen. You just need to say, you see further down the road. I'm just going to do what you're going to tell me. Amen. I don't need to understand it, except, sir, I would ask for my own maturity. As I grow, if I am incapable of understanding at this moment, Lord, I ask you as time goes on for you to teach me and to show me that. Yes. And he will. Mm -hmm. He will. Because I mean, he's good. It's like, uh, you know, when Victoria looks up at clouds and says, Daddy, why is there thunder? Now, I'm not going to tell her God is bowling, you know, and all of that stuff. On the other side of it, I'm not going to sit down and explain atmospherics and cumulus clouds and all this other stuff because she's going to go, Daddy's on one of those things again. <laughs> Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Guys, the quicker we acknowledge that he is God, that he is in love with us. And that's, that is a big part of this, is one of the reasons we demand understanding is we do not trust his love for us. That daddy loves me, and if daddy says put the power cord down, I don't need to understand why daddy's telling me to put the power cord down because daddy's in love with me, and whatever direction he is giving me, is for my good. Right. And he doesn't mind explaining things, but honestly, sometimes him trying to explain it to you from your perspective, you just, you would not understand it anyway. Right. That's the reason Jesus says, there's more I'd say to you, but you can't, you wouldn't get it. Right? I mean, he said some things about the Lord as, I mean, the angels don't get it. Nobody gets it. Nobody could, nobody could see into it until this time. Right. There are things that I'm saying, things that have been done that men of old wanted to look into, but could not. Right. Are you with me? Yeah. You know, I'm not even where I was wanting to get to, but you, you need... This wasn't today's message. Yes, but we need to get a hold of this because please do not be like me because I was the dunce of the class arguing with the expert in the matter. I'm sitting there. There were so many times that I allowed my natural intelligence to interfere with my receiving from the Lord, with God doing things in my life, because I demanded that my natural intelligence understand it before I would yield to it. And I eventually had to get to the places, there are things beyond, far beyond my natural intelligence at this moment, or my spiritual knowledge, mm -hmm. that I didn't know this about God, that I didn't understand this law, of the Spirit. I didn't get it. And so if he had tried to, and, and listen, I suffered great hurt because I wanted this to get it. Right. But Pastor Kurt gave me really great advice when I was <clears throat> a real baby and, and walking with the Lord. And we, we listened to a service, and so many things about the service just bothered me. 
it just bothered me. And so I was talking to him, to Pastor Kurt, and I was like, well, but he said this, and that, he like, no, no, you know, because it just bothered me. And he said, listen, you don't un- understand everything right now. Put it on a shelf. Don't throw it away. Put it on a shelf, and as you get the foundational things that you need for it to make sense, that piece will fit. And too many times we don't realize how ignorant we are. You know, we we think we're further along than we are because of our age or something like that. And we think that we know what we don't know. So don't throw it away just because you're missing the foundational piece that's going to make it make sense. Now, let me go back to this with with this peace settling with finality. Listen, I don't want to hear about people. If you have an angelic visitation, if you have the Lord Jesus appear to you, if a prophet walks up and gives you a word, and yet what you're seeing, feeling, and touching does not first bear witness with the word. If it bears witness to the word, just throw it away. I mean, I wouldn't even bother to pray about it. it does not bear witness it, oh, with the word, me. just oh, yeah, throw excuse it me. away. Yeah, if it, if it does not, let me say it like this. If it doesn't line up with the scriptures, pitch it. I mean, don't even put it on a shelf. Just put it in a garbage can, throw it away. Right? right. If you can, if you can, if it contradicts the written word of God. But even if Jesus were to appear to me right now and I could see him, and it was such that I could walk up and touch him and I could see the nail scar, the nails in his hands and all that, or nail scars in his hands. If he says something that doesn't line up with this word, I'm going to show him the door and explain to him, you ain't Jesus. The second thing, though, is, is if he says something and it sounds like Scripture or it sounds good, and yet I have no peace on the inside about what he's saying, I'm not doing it. I don't care that it looks like him. And I'm not talking about peace in my head. I'm talking about peace in my heart. And people say, well, that, I wouldn't do that. I understand because you're not allowing peace to settle with finality questions that arise in your mind. How, how do you think it is that uh, the devil was able to quote Scripture to Jesus and Jesus was able to say, but, but that doesn't apply. This is the Scripture that applies. Right? And remember, he quoted it verbatim. He, did, yeah. he, he quoted, you can jump off the side of this mountain and... Angels will guard you up lest you dash your foot against the stone. It is extracted identically from Psalm 91. He didn't, he didn't even alter the words. And so you have to be watchful because there are people that will quote Scripture to you, but it'll seem wrong on the inside of you. You will have things happen that are real. They are, they, they, you literally, you could walk in here and tell me, I had a visitation of Jesus. He stood in front of me. I saw the way he looked like. I saw the holes. And he told me that uh, I was supposed to divorce Terry and I'm supposed to go marry someone else. That's just crazy. Yeah. And, and, um, <laughs> and see when that happens. And, and see, it would be real. It w- I'm saying it would be, w- I'm not doubting your experience. Right. Right. I'm just saying, not, not even that I doubt your experience, I'm telling you that experience is not God. Right. Because there would be no peace about it. Well, I was, you know, this prophet, he's a, a world-renowned prophet, and he said do this, but, man, it just, on the inside of me, every time I think about doing it, it I just don't have any peace about it. Then I wouldn't do it. And here's the trouble with that, is that too many people are looking to hear from God through somebody else. Yeah. And you... We, we have seen so many people come close to a train wreck because a prophet gave them a word and it was, it, and it could have been God, but it wasn't the right time. They weren't supposed to say anything. They might have had a word of knowledge. We've also seen people who just, they knew what, the, so if I know George is believing for a new car and I'm, it's just, I want it for her so bad. Yeah. Sometimes the, that, guy, the person is not of ill intent. No, I want it for her so bad. I start prophesying over her. The Lord's given you a brand new car. You, you go, you, your car's on its way. You'll have it in the next 30 days. And then all of a sudden, 31 days from now, she's like, what, what happened? Why, why isn't this working? What, what, what did I do? And then all of a sudden, now there's a separation between her and God because she had a word from God 
that wasn't from God. It was big in the person. Person, I just want this. So I know what you want, and I want it for you. And so you can't listen. If it doesn't bear witness with your spirit, you know, it, what, at our ladies' ministry, at our conference, our retreat, there's oftentimes we have words of knowledge for people. And we'll minister as we're ministering to them in our, in our prayer lines. And I always say, does it bear witness with you? Because if it does not bear witness with you, you don't go with it. It doesn't matter who says it. Not with your head. With your heart. With your heart. With you, you, your, your spirit, man. Now, were you going to read something? Cause, no. Okay. The, I, I, want, I do want to show you two things with this. Man, I'm, go with me to John chapter 7. And I'm going to give you a, a hint. And this goes in with what um, Pastor Terry just said. There's a question. Jesus has been teaching, and they're trying to decide, where did this guy get this, and is this God or not? Anybody ever had that question? On the inside, is this God or not? Is this God or not? Okay. So this is what Jesus tells them. We're going to go to verse 16. (laughs) I'm not going to read it. Go ahead, girl. Go ahead. It said... Okay, so verse 15 says, And the Jews marveled, saying, How does this man know letters, having never studied? And Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not my own, but his who sent me. Here's the key, Pastor Chris, trying to get you to. If anyone wills to do his will, my Father's will, he shall know concerning the doctrine, whether it is from God or whether I speak of my own authority. So what, what, what's the principle Jesus says here? If you, if your will is to do this, his will, then you will be able to discern what is God and what is not. If you will to do his will. Now, there's a couple things with this. It's not even the will to know his will. It's the will to do it. Because there are people like, well, I'd like to know. I'd like to hear what he has in mind and then I'll decide whether I'm going to do it. You've never had that con- I have. And he, him, he starts saying, I, I have something for you to do. Oh, well, okay, well, let's hear it, and I'll let you know whether I'll do it or not. I, listen, I, I'm, I can be real with you. I've done that. I've, I've done really stupid stuff with the Lord. But you have to get to the place that you will to do his will is the underlining principle of your life because that allows you to discern whether something is God or not. But if your will... Some people say they will to do His will, but there's like caveats, right? They have... There's some criteria. I will to do your will as long as it's not this. As long as I don't have to do it with this person. Are you with me? as long as it fits within these parameters, as long as I don't have to give up too much. I will to do your will as long as it doesn't upset my wife, as long as it doesn't upset my kids, as long as it doesn't upset my mom and daddy. As as long long as I'll still have money in my pocket. Yeah, whatever it might happen to be, there's a caveat. And that automatically begins to interfere with your hearing and your ability to know what God is saying. And and a lot of times, even if it is the exact same thing, because it's kind of like walking into the throne room and you bring your will with you, right? And people say, well, I'll do anything God asks me to do. But there's a part of you that cries out, but please don't ask me to do this. Right? And so, I remember one okay, time... Okay, I'm going to give you an example. Lord, I'll do anything you want. Please just don't let it be in a cold climate. That's true. Right? I'll give you a worse example. There was this <laughs> girl that it, she was... I, I met her. She was, a, she was a wonderful girl, honestly. Um, she was terribly ugly. And, um, and I was terribly carnal. And I thought she had a lot of attributes, and I was very fearful that the Lord was going to ask me to marry her. I'm, I'm being honest. And so at one point she says, I believe we're supposed to be married. And I was thinking, God, I hope not. I Please, no. 
And, um, and so I, I, I would pray and I'd say, Lord, if you want me to marry her, I will. But there was a part, part of me saying, well, I don't want to. <laughs> right? And so what would happen is, is I couldn't hear God saying no because my own I don't want to, please don't make me, was so loud it interfered with me being able to tell what was God and what was not. People say, well, that's just carnal. Yes. Yeah. I already <laughs> said that. Yes. I never told you I was perfect. But, but here's the thing. She's perfect for me. That is true. But see, the thing of it is, is people will sit there, and when they begin to talk to the Lord, they haven't gotten to the place that I will to do His will. I, that, that that's what I want to do, no matter what it is. Now, and, and here's the thing. Agreeing with God's will does not mean that your head automatically is on board. Okay? That your, your will is your mind, your will, and your emotions. Okay? We, we have to literally crucify our will. You know, we talk about crucifying our flesh, but that's under that carnality is your will sometimes. Well, all the time. Well, and and, and, and and we have to bring it into subjection. And not necessarily just crucify it, but you you actually, I'd like to say it like this: I'm going to take my will, like Jesus did. I'm going to take my will, and I'm going to make it line up with your will. Not my will, but Thy will be done. That's not just a crucifixion. That is saying, I am now making a decision mm -hmm. that Your will is now my will that I'm going to change it. And, and let me give you an example of this and with, with Pastor Terry and I, because this has happened. She, she one time, she would ask, I, I would tell her in order to bless her, I would go to some event with her, right? And she would, she eventually came to me and she said, please don't volunteer to come. You, I know you're thinking you're being a good husband, volunteering to come to these events, but you make me pay for it when you come. Because you sit there and you are, I can tell you don't want to be here. You make it clear you don't want to be here. But you're suffering for Jesus and for me. And it's evident. Right? So I'm, I'm doing the right thing, but I'm not in the blessing mood. I'm in the suffering for Jesus mood. Right? And, and see, this is what happens with people is they're like, I don't really want to do this. But I will for Jesus. And that interferes with your hearing. Nowadays, what I do is I'll actually grab a hold of my will. And if he says that he wants me to do something, even if it sounds absolutely horrible. Uh, Japan would probably be one of the best things. To, to, I did not want to go to Japan. I spent months explaining to him I was not going. And because he wanted me to go. And um, then Minister Curtis, you know, by the Spirit of the God, began to deal with me about it. And, but now it is my will. I, I, but I literally had to sit down and say... If it's your will, then it is my will. <clears throat> now, the, all this ties back to believing God loves you yeah. and learning how to trust God. Where it says in the scripture, the willing and the obedient eat the good of the land. What is the outcome of being willing and obedient? Eat the good of the land. Eating the good of the land. So is good in there? Yeah. Yes. So is it bad? No. No. So the willing and the obedient. Willingness comes down to... I love you. I will do this because I love you. And obedience comes down to, I do this, I obey because I trust you. So it is, I love you, Lord, and I trust you, Lord. Therefore, I will do what your will is. And, and I you know love it turns me. out I for my good. I can trust you because you love me. Now, we, we got to stop, but let me... Let me give you this no, tip. No, fun. Let's huh? keep going. No, let me, They're let in me, soft chairs. Let me give you this tip. About this. Um, this, this was extremely difficult for me because, believe it or not, I can be somewhat strong willed. And so it's true. I know it's probably hard to believe, but this is, this is what I had to do. There were many things that my will literally would cry out don't, we're not, I'm not doing this. I'm not doing this. I'm not doing this. Even while my mouth and my heart were saying, you know what, I, I, I want to do God's will. I want to do God's will. And, but my will is going, as long as it's not this, we're not doing that. And so I would literally sit there 
and I would say, I will to do your will. And every time it came up, we have, but as long as it's sat in that, no, no, I will to do your will. And every time my will began to speak up, I would grab it by the throat and say, no, that's not, that's not what I'm, where I'm going. I will to do your will. And a lot of times before I even ask the Lord questions, I would spend time doing that, that no matter what you say, no matter what it is, I'm going to do it because my will is to do your will. No caveats, nothing held back. I'm not going to tell you I want to hold on to the pigs. I'm not going to tell you it's got to be this way. I'm just going to tell you, Lord, that I will to do your will. And if I'm not there, I, I am extremely honest with myself and saying, I'm not there at this moment. So what do I do? I sit there and I get there. That doesn't mean that your will doesn't say, but, but can I say something? No. 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 I will to do his will. Amen. That, that is the overriding principle. There is nothing else added to that. There's nothing else taken away from it. It, it doesn't, I, I, don't ha, I don't have a list of things that it has to meet. It is I will to do your will. And if you've had trouble hearing from God, that is going to be a big reason because of what Jesus is saying. The reason these guys that were sitting there that worked for him, that had been spending time in his word their entire lives, could not recognize what he was saying. The reason he could not put new wines into old wineskins is they did not will to do God's will. They willed to do God's will as long as they kept their power. They willed to do God's will as long as they kept their influence. They willed to do God's will as long as it fit within the box of Moses. They willed to do God's will as long as it kept up with their traditions. Mm -hmm. And so they're standing there in the very fulfillment of everything that they're ever studied. And they cannot tell who he is because they did not will to do his will. And so what does Jesus say? If you truly willed to do his will, you would know who I am and you'd know whether what I was saying was from God or not. That's right. And this is not just in this. This is in every aspect of your life. Jesus could be standing there right there giving you direction. And unless you've come to the place that I only want to do your will, that's it. It doesn't have to fit any preconceived notion I had. Then you're going to have trouble recognizing what's God and what's not. Right. Amen? Amen? Now, again, what Pastor Terry said, and my portion is done. Obviously, I've said I'm not an evangelist. But uh, one of the things that I, I want you to get out of this is there is nothing God... What God asks you to do will at times not be comfortable there will at times be a stretching, right? That it'll be, it'll be take you out of your comfort zone. But there will never be anything that God ever asks you to do that is not on the basis of his love for you and his love for someone else or other things. But he's not, people get this idea, well, I'm, I'm afraid he would ask me to go to Africa and live in a mud hut. If he actually asked you to do that, if you actually got to the place that you will to do his will, you would have more joy than you've ever known mm -hmm. in a mud hut mm -hmm. in Africa. Mm -hmm. Now, here, let me just say this. You don't get points for following God if you treat God the way I treated Pastor Terry going to the events. I'm here. You know, the scripture says I'm willing and obedient, not I'm obedient doesn't say if I'm obedient. It says if I'm willing and obedient. So you don't get to, and you understand it's not brownie points to go with your spouse to a meeting with their family if you make everybody miserable while you're there and you let everybody know, I'm only here, right? You all are all devils from hell, but because I'm a good Christian and a good husband, that's why I'm here. Don't worry, Mom and Dad. He I'm not you. talking about y'all. If y'all were devils from hell, I'd tell you. And uh, so, uh, so the thing of it is, is that but you've got to get you've got to get to the place 
that I'm in the will of God and I'm not looking for a pat on the back and I'm not sitting there miserable while I'm doing it. I actually will to be exactly where I'm standing. This is where I want to be because, Lord, beyond anything else, I want to be in the center of your will. Mud hut in Africa, Hawaii on the beach, doesn't matter, Lord, as long as I'm in the center of of your will. That's all I care about. And I'm not going to, I'm not sitting here kicking and screaming. No, I'm where I want to be because I want to be in the center of your will. Amen. 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 I love you. I will see you all in just a minute. You know, and it's funny because I remember my college roommate, she, um, she became an FBI field agent. And when she graduated from Quantico, she had a list of 50 cities that she could put her, her, you know, kind of the wish list of 50 cities that she'd want to be on. And so I guess she ran out of cities, and San Francisco became number 50. And that's where she ended up. Now, we're not even going to go into how she really doesn't like it there, but she's still in the FBI, right? And made the best of it, had a great you know, has had a great career and everything. But the bottom line comes down to when we say, listen, I want to do God's will, I'll do it wherever you tell me to do it. You know, if she, she'd end up in Podunk, Idaho, it'd be, she's still part of the FBI, right? Here's the thing. God wants for you to be fulfilled of who, with who you are in him. If your identity is founded on who you are in him, if your joy is founded on the Lord chose me to be a part of his family because he loves me, if your peace is founded on the Prince of Peace resides on the inside of me and the only time it's disturbed is when I'm, it was when I'm getting off. Not because I'm being attacked, not because things aren't going right and it's making me want to pout. My peace is only disturbed if I'm getting off course and not, not listening to the voice of the Lord or the word of the Lord, right? If, if who you are is not based on where you're employed, what you do, who likes you, who doesn't, then that's where your peace, your joy, your fulfillment is all founded in him, right? It's not, it, you know... <laughs> God loves you right where you're at. He wants us to grow. He wants us to love him. He wants to be in a relationship with us that it's, it's not just one-sided. You know, it's so funny because from the very beginning, Victoria just responds to us. And I think of our relationship with the Father in relation to that because you look at, you look at the Lord and really, he just loves us. He's just pouring out love. He's just ministering to us all the time. But when you just go and you just love him, right, and you're just, you don't want anything from him. You just want to spend time with him. You just want love. You, want, you just want to love on him. And I, I mean, my heart melts. That child looks at us, and she just loves us. And she doesn't, you know, she doesn't always want something, right? Sometimes she's fed, changed, and completely content. And all she is just to fellowship and, and spend time and love us. And that just, I just want to give her everything I possibly can. See, and I, like parenthood gives you a new perspective or a deeper perspective, the way that God loves us. Because she can do. Am I done? Okay. Um, <laughs> I, thought, I thought Cal was saying, I'm finished. <laughs> Pastor. Pastor Kurt handed this to you minutes ago, and you're still talking. It's time for you to quit now. Is Minister Curtis controlling that? No, just kidding. Um, but listen, when we realize that we are loved and we are complete in, there, in the love that he has for us, and we yield to that and we rest in that, this following after the will of God and desiring to do God's will, is going to start to be a process. And again, like Pastor Kurt said, listen, we're still, we, this isn't, this, this isn't something that just you do it once and you're done. 
You understand? Like, we had every intention of being at service last night. We got, like, a couple hours of sleep so that we could get on an airplane to be here with y'all, and then the weather did something weird in Palm Beach, and we got rerouted. We hung out in Fort Myers for a while before we came home last night. And I'm sitting there, and I remember when Pastor Kurt was buying the tickets, and he's like, well, do you want to do this? Because then we could be back on Saturday night for service. I said, no. I do not want to do that. Because we had to be at the airport at 5 o'clock yesterday morning, Colorado time, right? So um, so I was tired after a fun week, right? I did, I did not want to. But then I realized, listen, I'm going to do whatever God's will is for us, right? Anyway. I digress. So you're going to always be doing that. It's not going to be a one and done. You have to constantly put yourself in a place of, I want to do the will of God for my life. Now, the very first step to doing God's will for your life is to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Remember, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. The very first step is accepting Jesus as your Lord and Savior, believing that Jesus came, he is the Son of God, that he died for your sins, and that God raised him from the dead. And, you know, and it's bigger and bigger on the inside of me more and more. We need to keep talking about that he's coming back. You know, he, Jesus is returning. Okay, three people believe that. Jesus is returning. It's exciting. And in the meantime, we need to populate heaven. We need to share Jesus with everybody. We need to let them know, listen, God is not mad at you. God is in love with you, and he wants you to be a part of his family and, sir, and, 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 and hang out for all of eternity in relationship with him because he's coming back. I'm excited about that. I, you know, when I was young, I was scared about that. I'm not scared. I'm excited. I just want to make sure everybody I love is coming with me and everybody that the Lord has we, for us to talk to, we do. So if you're in this place or you're listening and watching online and you desire to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, then we're, we would like to give you that opportunity. And the first thing is, just like I said, that you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that you believe that he died for your sin, and that you believe that God raised him from the dead. And when you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, then you're saved. And so if I could have every head bowed, every eye closed, if you're in this place and you say, yes, I desire to make Jesus the Lord of my life, if you'll raise your hand, it will be my honor and my privilege to pray with you this morning. And if you're, if you're responding online, then I'm going to ask you, after we've prayed this prayer, for you to send us an email at connect at reallifefl.com, or you just click the contact us button, and just let us know that you got saved. Because as we keep on talking about, it's the beginning of an exciting journey. Amen. There's a lot of learning to do, but it's worth it. Let's all pray this prayer together. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for sending Jesus, your son, to die for my sin. I believe that you raised him from the dead. Lord Jesus, I believe in my heart and I confess with my mouth that you are my Lord and you are my Savior. I receive that I am forgiven and that I am free. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Did y'all get something out of that today? Amen. Let's see. Well, you know, our goal is to make and marshal disciples who know Jesus and love and live like him. And, you know, as we're doing that, you know, these services, they may seem, you know, really basic, but these are the foundation building blocks that we all need to, to, to have in order to move forward. Right. And like Pastor Kurt said, after receiving Jesus, this is the most crucial thing that you'll ever do. So never forget that everything that you hear or, you know, get get this impression that you're supposed to do has to line up with the written word of God. God is never going to speak to you to tell you to do something that's contradictory to what he has said in his word. And then after that, we follow the peace. Those are the two paramount things that we that Pastor Kurt was hitting on hard today. And so let's make sure that we desire to do God's will, right? And that and and listen, I know that when I've made mistakes, sometimes it was in the integrity of my heart, in the innocence of my hands. And God has always delivered me. Amen. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for the word that is sown in our hearts today. Lord, we thank you because you love us, because you are so good. 
And, Lord, that there's mercy for all the mistakes that we've made. And we are so grateful for your mercy. We are grateful for your kind intent toward us. We are grateful because you love us. And, Lord, I thank you for the Holy Spirit who brings to remembrance all these scriptures so that we can walk out exactly what you've called us to do and that we can be everything that you've called us to be. And I command blessings down upon these, your people. In Jesus' name, amen. I love you all very much.